Uh, I, I suppose in the overall kind of trajectory of this conference, um, I've been cast as somebody who goes and head to head with a previous speaker. I mean, that's hopefully amusing for the audience. It might be foolish of me because obviously Professor Shoemaker is a formidable scholar whom I greatly respect. I should say that. Hello, Stephen. Um, um, and I would also say that um, this clash of alternative models, actually, I, I do think is something that is important. So I, I, I would like to say, hopefully convincingly, that I welcome that. I mean, I don't think I would have done a doctorate on the Quran um, had it not been the case that so much is at stake in the study of early Islam. So that's kind of the gist of, I think, why we're here. Um, so it's a welcome opportunity. We'll see what comes of it. Um, now, much of the Quranic corpus, um, as I say in my abstract, is, is shot through um, with a panoply, a rich panoply of Christian traditions, um, eschatological traditions, cosmological traditions, the important aspects of Quranic diction that I think need to be placed against the Christian background, you know, asara, the hour, that is Christian diction, and so on and so forth. Um, um, and at, at least sometimes the Quran doesn't merely talk about Christians, but, but it clearly also talks to Christians. So Christians aren't um, just a community who sort of who are over the, over the immediate horizon um, of, of the Quran. They are addressed at least in, in some verses. Um, so the various interlocutors of the Quran must, in some sense, have included Christians. Um, now, Guillaume D, amongst others, um, in his uh, contribution to the Courant des Historiens, he points out that um, the preceding observations that I've just tried to summarize sit somewhat uneasily um, with the lack of evidence for organized Christianity in the milieu in which the Quran supposedly emerged. And, um, and that has been uh, pointed out by, um, by Professor Shoemaker at, at length. Um, so let's call this the, uh, the Christian elephant in the room, if you will humor me in sort of with a nod to Surah 105, um, which describes the sorry fate of the men of the elephant. I'm not implying that either party to this dispute will get you know, hammered by scary birds. Um, it's just a, um, I don't know, a pointless pun, maybe. Um, so this Christian elephant is also invoked by Tommaso Tissay. Um, and of course, it figures very prominently in uh, Stephen Shoemaker, Shoemaker's recent monograph, uh, Creating the Quran, which I've um, had the pleasure to read. Um, both Dee and Shoemaker also contend that the, the explanatory problem that is generated by the Christian elephant cannot be solved uh, by an appeal to oral tradition. Uh, so in, in Stephen's words, the oral transmission of Christian law from individuals who had traveled to Christian lands cannot sufficiently explain the deep familiarity with Christian tradition that the Quran demands from both its author, authors um, and audience. Now, I, I actually don't intend to deny that the Christian elephant in the room is, is a problem. I do believe that the um, uh, Tommaso and, um, and uh, Shoemaker are being a bit operatic. Um, so what I'd like to do first is to, to try to explain why I don't think that the problem is quite as untractable. But then secondly, I will acknowledge that there are some residual loose ends um, in the standard paradigm with which I continue to operate. So, um, so there are problems. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I, I will try to sort of return the favor and try to pinpoint a few loose ends um, that, I le that, that are left by the scenario that, that is offered by um, D, uh, Tisse, and Shoemaker themselves. Um, so to take the first point um, first, um, yeah, why the problem may not be quite as um, untractable. Um, maybe just um, to, to start off, um, um, a point in passing. It's, it's true that the Islamic tradition portrays Mecca as a Christ-barren um, environment, as um, Shoemaker puts it in a wonderful phrase. Um, um, there's a very small and very interesting number of um, glimpses of what seems to be a communal Meccan presence in Mecca that Irfan Shahid has dug up. Um, there's this enigmatic reference to a Meccan, uh, sorry, to a Christian cemetery in or you know, somewhere close to Mecca in al Azraqi's um, history of Mecca. I haven't really been able to do much with these very um, enigmatic and, and extremely um, sort of concise uh, glimpses. So I'll, I'll just leave that there and pass it. And I, I think somebody should look at that. Um, but the cemetery of the Christians certainly does um, raise questions. Um, but secondly, and uh, um, more importantly, um, the issue of missionary exposure and uh, oral tradition. Now, I, I do have sympathy with Guillaume D's um, complaint that um, an appeal to oral tradition often seems to function like this um, generic get out of jail card, like, you know, it's oral tradition and, and somehow everything's solved. Um, I also don't find it convincing to posit um, that Muhammad and other Meccans 
would have acquired a substantial knowledge of Christianity by you know, traveling all around the um, um, Near East as, as part of um, um, some sort of international um, trading network. I, I think the idea that Mecca was an international hub of trade has been rather convincingly been put to rest by Patricia Crone. Um, so if there was Mecca trade at all, it must, I think it must be envision, in, envisioned as much more modest. Um, I, do, however, think that an appeal to missionary activity might, to some degree, be capable of, of blunting um, or, you know, of reining in the Christian elephant, if you wish. Um, so I see no reason to rule out that Christian preachers, monks, ascetics um, might have sought to convert the inhabitants of Western Arabia, just as they did further north, um, and that would have exposed the targets of this missionary endeavours. Um, um, to a certain amount of, um, of Christian narratives, um, Christian stories, Christian imaginations of the last judgment, um, and some basic Christian notions and concepts, you know, like the idea that um, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, for instance. Um, now, I can't use any positive evidence um, uh, that there was much Christian missionary activity in the Hijaz, um, so I'm, I'm definitely coloring in a blank spot here um, in such a way as to make sense of the data before me um, and also to safeguard certain pre existing historical commitments of mine that I'm not quite yet ready to let go. But um, the point I'd like to stress at this juncture would be that I, I think we all inevitably end up doing that. I mean, we all color in um, blank spots um, in order to create a coherent historiographic picture. I think that's true for both of the models that are um, on offer here. Um, now, if there was missionary activity of the sort that I've um, just surmised, then clearly it can't have been very successful, uh, very successful, because otherwise we'd hear about it, which we don't. Um, but the assumption that the you know, poor pagans of the Hejaz had for some time been harangued by Christian fire and brimstone preachers um, fits, I think, rather well with the fact that the Quran's opponents, according to the Quran, rejected Muhammad's preachings as um, you know, ancient scribblings, al-Satir al-Awwalin, um, something that was um, familiar, just not you know, very credible. Uh, Christian missionary activity in the Hijaz would also give us a sufficient degree of, um, of awareness of Christianity as a serious ideological option, I think, in order to explain why the Quranic proclamations on occasion find it necessary to, um, uh, to critique Christ Christian beliefs and practices, and, and sometimes even to address Christians directly. Um, now, a potential objection to that, wouldn't one expect um, the other way around? Christian missionary activity, clearly, um, one wouldn't expect to yield a very sophisticated awareness of Christian theology or you know, a deep familiarity with Christian liturgy. Um, so you know, one might pose the question whether that's not a problem uh, in view of the Quran as we have, have it. And I would actually um, respond in the negative to that. Um, and that's a point that um, James, um, I think, made more concisely earlier. Um, I, I think it's true that um, the Quran's intersections with Christian traditions are numerous and, and also fundamental to the Quran's own theology, but they are nonetheless mostly limited to um, stories, eschatological motifs, and, and you know, a certain number of core concepts, like you know, Ruh al-Qudus is clearly descended from uh, the Holy Spirit, um, although I think it's not very likely that the Quran anywhere envisages the Holy Spirit as as a person in a trinity. It seems to be more of a, of a quasi-angelic figure, but, but the, the term clearly has a Christian genealogy behind it. Um, uh, but all of it is um, ultimately pretty basic. I mean, the Quran doesn't contain complex summaries of Christian theological p positions. Um, in the case of Mary, the Quran's understanding that she is um, considered to be divine is notoriously inaccurate. Um, and I don't think that's just a hapless misunderstanding. I think it's, you know, it's a sly... Um, rhetorical distortion for polemical reasons, but uh, I do wonder whether one could have gotten away with that maneuver in, in Palestine or in Mesopotamia. Um, now, it's true that the Quran reflects awareness um, of um, Christians believing in the divinity of Jesus, but, but that really is a very um, basic point um, to have picked up. Um, so I think Quranic acquaintance with Christianity is, 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 is extensive rather than intensive. Um, and one could argue, um, I guess I would argue, I am arguing that this fits a scenario of missionary exposure rather well. Now to say holds that um, against this assessment that the Quran often comes across as, I quote, the product of a flourishing Christian center. And, and that's clearly a sentiment that um, Guillaume D and also um, Stephen Shoemaker share. Um, I, I don't find that very convincing. Um, 
I would submit that the Quran is actually strikingly devoid of precise theological, heresiographical, or ritual Christian language. Um, there are no Quranic words for, you know, diophysite or Eucharist or for a person of the Trinity. Um, so you, you couldn't imagine a monophysite and a diophysite, you know, having a disagreement with each other in Quranic Arabic because the words are just not in the text. I mean, I do think that there probably were words for this in Arabic, but they're not in the Quran. Um, so the Quranic corpus is characterized by a curious combination of features, actually. It, you know, there's a considerable degree of engagement with Christian traditions um, of a narrative, cosmological and eschatological type, but that is not concomitant with the expected degree of specific doctrinal, sacramental, and ecclesiastical references. Um, and there are other regards um, in which the Quran is, is I think interestingly out of step with um, mainstream late antique Christianity on, on which I'm not an expert, so possibly I'm mistaken here, but um, as I argue in a forthcoming book, the Quran somewhat archaically envisages the deity um, um, as having a humanoid body, potentially of light, um, um, which has some real affinities with ancient Israelite notions, but it's certainly not the way in which I think late antique Christians would have routinely um, understood God. Um, I also don't think there's any compelling evidence that the Quran has an understanding of creation as something that precedes ex nihilo, um, which was standard Christian doctrine at the time. Um, and then the Quran is pervaded by this kind of far-reaching mood of cosmic affirmation. So any idea that the created order has fallen or flawed or in need of redemption, that's just completely elided. Um, so in at least three respects, the Quran is, I think, theologically um, out of step or you know, goes against the grain of mainstream late antique Christian theology. Um, now, it's possible that the authors of the Quran intentionally took up unconventional positions, you know, even if they were positioned in Mesopotamia or Palestine, but um, um, I suppose I would have expected them to address and refute the alternative positions, um, which I don't find to be uh, the case. Um, so I would contend that there are many features of the Quran that are actually easily compatible with gestation in an environment um, that had been exposed to relatively unsuccessful um, Christian missionary preaching rather than an environment in which mainstream Christian um, doctrine and liturgy um, had come to be fully established. Um, maybe to conclude this point of missionary exposure, um, a plausible impa impact of Christian missionary preaching on the Quran could, could also be detected in, in the Quran's sort of pervasive discourse of, of signs or ayat, um, this idea that certain natural phenomena um, are indicants that, that point to theological truths. Um, um, so God's revivification of the earth by means of rain um, anticipates the eschatological raising of the dead. Um, so these motifs have well-documented Christian precedents, and, and it seems very plausible to me to um, assume that they would have been a, you know, a staple of Christian missionary preaching. If you want to rope in new converts, um, maybe that's where you start. Um, a third point. Um, regarding the alleged impossibility of placing much of the Quran in a Hijazi context. Um, um, it's just really to reiterate a proposal I made a few years ago, which um, obviously hasn't convinced everyone. I'll, I'll um, put it in nonetheless. So when we try to imagine the religious milieu um, that pre-Islamic Mecca might have been like, um, maybe we should think less in terms of a tidy separation between you know, fully paid up card carrying Christians on the one hand and then pagans, um, stubborn pagans rejecting um, Christianity, lock, stock and barrel. Maybe we should rather envisage a, a syncretistic fusion of, um, of native Arabian cults with a certain number of Jewish and Christian concepts, um, narratives and practices. Um, and such syncretism, um, and I use the term descriptively, I'm aware many people don't like it, I see nothing wrong with it really. Um, um, uh, such syncretism would fit rather well, for instance, with this famed statement by Al-Azraqi that um, there were pictures of Mary and Jesus in the Kaaba when the Prophet um, um, uh, uh, entered Mecca. It would also fit eminently well with the latent monotheistic tendencies of um, that, that scholars really from Ibn Taymiyyah on to Patricia Krona have, I think, convincingly um, discerned in, in the theology of the Quranic uh, associators, the Mushrikun, um, the primary opponents of the Quran in the so-called Meccan surahs, um, who, who seem to clearly recognize that there's um, um, a creator deity who's ultimately supreme and, and other deities um, play this 
uh, mediating uh, function. I, I think that would sit rather well in a sort of syncretistic um, paradigm. Uh, and maybe such a syncretistic you know, uptake and retooling of certain biblically-based notions like you know, angels, intercession, would also um, go some way to explaining you know, why the, uh, the pagans of the Hejaz were so successful in actually res resisting Christian missionary uh, encroachment. Um, so some of these culturally prestigious ideas had been taken on board already, and that's why maybe they could hold out longer. Um, um, now, um, despite all of these attempts to um, respond to some of um, the problems that, that have been raised about the traditional Nildekian paradigm, um, um, I really don't want to deny that you know, there are explanatory loose ends here that, that um, Dee, Tessay, and Shoemaker um, put their fingers on. Um, um, maybe similar to the, um, the disconnect that Patricia Crone has um, discerned between you know, the picture of nature in the Quran and the actual ecology of the Hejaz. I mean, there too, I think, you can say a lot of things in, in response. You can sort of de-dramatize the problem, but it doesn't go away entirely. So um, that's a, you know, an, an issue to be, um, to be pondered. Um, now, D responds to the, um, the problem uh, that's constituted by the Christian elephant by uh, recommending um, that we sever at least parts of the Quran um, from the career of Muhammad and you know, date them after the death of Muhammad, take them out of a Hijazi context. Um, Tomaso Tessay, in a 2022 article, um, um, is making a very similar move. So in, in highly welcome detail, um, he uh, tries to um, actually ascertain parts of the Quran that he is willing to date to um, the life of Muhammad with the implication that the rest probably um, belongs elsewhere. Um, so that's a fascinating um, study because he really goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with texts, a lot of texts. He, he gives us a list of um, you know, surahs and passages that constitute, in his opinion, the likely um, Muhammadan kernel of the Quran. Um, but he makes a similar sort of severing move of, of taking part of the Quran and, and disassociating it um, from, um, uh, from the career of Muhammad. Um, and uh, Stephen Shoemaker operates with a similar model we've just heard. He, he doesn't deny that the Quran's ultimate point of uh, origin is the preaching of Muhammad in Western Arabia. Um, and that's a smart move because um, it evades the objection that you know, there's sacrifice in the Quran, there's names of Arabian deities, how do you deal with that? So this. Um, um, sort of revised um, skeptical um, paradigm that's on the table um, is able to kind of deal with those objections um, quite nimbly, I think. Um, and Shoemaker also argues that um, Muhammad's proclamations must have undergone a prolonged um, period of oral transmission before being committed to writing, probably in, probably in several regional streams um, and with a considerable degree of fluidity and, and malleability. Um, and then it was, according to him, by and large, only under Abdel Malik, uh, that the Quranic text, as we um, have it, was put together. Um, um, so the difference between Shoemaker and, uh, and Tomas's article is that uh, Shoemaker is, is much less optimistic that we can actually confidently identify a kernel of Quranic material that, you know, by and large, can be attributed to Muhammad. Um, um, it's, it's, he's much more vague on that front. So, We've got two theories on the table. So the standard one, um, you know, the Quran, all of the Quran, perhaps with a bit of tinkering around the edges, um, um, was delivered by Muhammad in early seventh century um, Western Arabia, and then um, a recent iteration of a more revisionist approach. Um, the emergence of Islam begins with Muhammad. Um, some of his preaching may still be found in the Quran, but most of the Quran is later and you know, comes from elsewhere. Um, um, it's interesting, maybe just in uh, in brackets, uh, there's a potentially significant point of agreement between both, both, both paradigms um, that emerges especially from um, the work of Tessay, um, who, um, who looks, I mean the surahs he looks at in his article that he's willing to sort of credit to Muhammad um, are essentially the early Meccan surahs um, according to Neldeke. And, and, and that's the bit of the Quran that he nominates as, um, as original. Um, and then the rest you know, is certainly removed from the assumption of, of, uh, of unitary authorship, um, but he still assumes that the other stuff in the Quran is later than the early Meccan surahs. Um, so like a died in the wool Deldekian, um, he would seem to recognize the possibility of lining the Quran or subdividing the Quran into a set of um, unilinear sort of temporally 
um, successive Sura groups. So um, the idea that you can work up a unilinear sort of evolutionary taxonomy of Quranic surahs is, is actually independent of whether or not you accept or deny um, single authorship. A shoemaker's um, model is, is more complicated on, on those grounds, but, um, but there's an interesting sort of taxonomic commonality between um, Tomas's work and, and a more sort of conventional Nodekian paradigm. Um, now, um, I think we should recognize that it's entirely conceivable that um, data can be explained satisfactorily by more than one explanatory model. Um, and it's also um, possible that we will need to kind of tentatively operate with more than one model and you know, experimentally fit them to the data on the table in, in order to decide which one is ultimately more promising and you know, how to flash it out and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, I, I do think that um, models come with explanatory challenges and costs. So um, in that spirit, um, I'd like to uh, maybe remind myself and, and you of some of the, um, the costs or challenges that are entailed by the D to say shoemaker model, um, which I haven't really found um, to be compellingly addressed yet in um, the publications of these three scholars, but maybe that will come. Um, so let me uh, begin with a, uh, well, the fact that it's overall difficult to pinpoint um, evidence of conquest age concerns in the Quran. Um, it's an argument I've made before. Um, again, some people obviously don't buy it, but let me try again. So let's assume that significant portions of the Quran, Quran came into being after the start of the Arab and or Muslim conquest. So, um, or, you know, that the Quran as we have it is a, is a mid-Umayyad recomposition of uh, earlier oral traditions that may or may not go back to, um, to Muhammad. So in that case, um, are we not entitled to expect the Quran to reflect these conquests and, and, and the internal strife that seems to have taken place amongst the conquerors? Um, so we are positing that the Quran was in flux until the mid-Umayyad period when the conquests were in full swing um, and when the, the presumptive authors and the redactors of the Quran were sort of ensconced as the intellectual spearhead of, you know, of this warrior elite who had just kind of taken over half of, um, of the Near East. Um, and I think we must assume that these authors and redactors would have had every interest to explain to themselves and you know, anybody who cared to listen why God had put them in charge, why they deserve to be um, funded by this massive subject uh, population. Um, but if that is true, then why is the Quran so singularly bereft of any specific comment on this matter? Um, I mean, why is there no explicit endorsement that the Arabs you know, deserve to rule the Holy Land um, and the former dominions of the Byzantines and the Sasanians? Um, and we can't respond to that by saying, oh, um, they were wary of putting anachronisms into the text because clearly there's quite a bit of anachronism in the Hadith and there's no reason to avoid anachronism if you believe that Muhammad is a prophet. I mean, you know, that's kind of the business he's in to uh, make anachronistically uh, correct predictions. Um, now, there's this well-known text, um, by now well-known, the um, Chronicle of Pseudocebius, uh, which gives us an interesting summary of Muhammad's uh, preaching, which I think interestingly contrasts with the Quran. So according to Pseudocebius, you know, Muhammad reportedly tells the Arabs that Abraham was their ancestor um, and they are therefore entitled to kind of seize the Holy Land uh, as their rightful patrimony, um, the Holy Land. Um, I think it makes sense to assume that that actually derives from ideas that were circulating among the early conquerors. That these were some of the things these people believed, and you know, that's why they were um, legitimate um, conquerors. Um, but if one looks at the Quran, if you actually go through it, um, I just cannot help but feeling that there's a, a striking absence of material that could be taken to articulate such conquest age um, preoccupations. Um, I think the Quran's you know, explicit territorial claims are generally limited to wrestling control over the Meccan sanctuary from the pagan associators. Um, so you get that in Surah 2 and Surah 9. Um, but otherwise, um, I would agree with uh, Ruben Firestone, who's argued a few years ago that the Quran actually does not articulate a message of territorial conquest. I mean, I think there's milit militancy in the Quran. Um, there's injunctions to fight the unbelievers and so on and so forth, but that's not the same as an ideology of territorial conquest. Um, I can really only see two relevant verses that might conceivably fit conquest age concerns. Um, so one is the famous verse that um, you know, commands the um, addressees of the Quran to take 
tributary compensation from unbelieving Jews and Christians, uh, Jizya. So, I mean, I think that's the verse you could put in, in a post-conquest um, context. Um, but, but that's not a lot of material. I mean, it really isn't all over the Quran. Um, I think other material that's been adduced uh, from the Quran is kind of chiming with um, pseudocebius. I'm, I'm really not convinced by. Um, I also disagree with... Um, um, Stephen's claim that the Quran is, is replete with anachronisms by virtue of allegedly adjusting the relationship between Muhammad's followers and Jews and Christians in light of post-650 developments. Um, we can maybe get into this in the Q&A because it, it, it involves um, um, Donna's idea of early Islam being an ecumenical movement. Um, I think there are problems with that analysis. Um, um, but I just wanted to put in a kind of a bookmark here that I don't think that that counts as anachronism. I think there's too much discussion around that. Um, another respect in which the Quran strikes me as quite um, lacking in conquest age concerns, uh, I guess it's the extremely high proportion of material that's um, polemicizing against the associators, the mushrikun. Um, um, I mean, I'm really not convinced that the Mushrikun are a cipher for some form of Christianity or Judaism as, as Horting and Kroner surmise in their otherwise excellent um, work. Um, I, so I, I really can't see um, post-conquest um, sort of redactors of the Quran sitting around and um, creating or composing or recomposing um, these lengthy polemics against, um, against the um, uh, associators. Um, I mean, one reason why I'm not convinced that they're a cipher for Christian or Jews is because there are passages where they figure quite explicitly besides An Nasada and Al Ladina Hadu. So they seem to be a separate um, religious community. Obviously, more could be said. Um, no doubt, more will be said. Um, the second point um, um, so the first one um, was um, lack of conquest age concerns. And obviously, that depends on material actually being worked through, right? So it's possible that tomorrow we'll get an article where somebody, you know, um, takes a passage and shows that actually it is much more convincingly placed in a, in a conquest age context, in which case, okay, well, we'll have to um, accept that. Um, you know, maybe the beginning of Surah Darum, I don't know, I'm not convinced, but I think that case really needs to be made for a substantial amount of, of material. Um, uh, okay, second point, um, um, which I term the Quran's interpretive recalcitrance. Um, so the Quran, in many respects, um, I think resists the interpretive construals that uh, later Muslims try to place on it um, in various ways. Um, now, as um, Shoemaker stresses at several junctures in his book, oral traditions are usually normalized in accordance with the contemporary self-understanding and you know, worldview of, um, of their bearers. So, Material that is no longer relevant is either discarded or it's, it's, it's remodeled. That's how oral tradition works. You don't just um, um, pass on stuff that you don't understand anymore or that directly contradicts um, what you believe yourself. Um, um, to maybe just flesh out what I mean by um, interpretive recalcitrance. Um, uh, so the Quran you know, neither supports the claims of Umayyad loyalists nor of allied loyalists. Um, you know, it mandates lashing for uh, adultery rather than stoning. You know, there's obscure terms, uh, the meaning of which seems to have escaped later Muslim interpreters. Um, and it passes up numerous opportunities of inscribing into the text of scripture um, some of the you know, concrete anecdotal details from the life of Muhammad that the Sira literature is kind of at pains to sort of, um, um, uh, sort of weave around the Quran. Um, so we don't get anecdotes um, about Muhammad um, doing this or doing that in the text of the Quran itself. Um, I think the idea that the Quran went through a protracted process of oral tradition um, in the course of which it was constantly remolded and recomposed, which is what um, uh, Stephen proposes, isn't really capable of accommodating this you know, basic feature of interpretive recalcitrance or, or resistance. Um, if there was oral tradition, then um, we wouldn't expect this to be the case. Um, and I think the, the best example, and I've used that before, so sorry for um, self-plagiarizing, the best example um, I can think of for, for, for this is, is really that, that verse in Surah 3 that talks about the, the temple that God has established at Bakka, right? Um, 
um, the first house that God has um, established for pe people is the one at Bakka. Oh, what's Bakka? Well, every, you know, the interpretive tradition tells us Bakka is Makkah, and, and they give us you know, some rather far-fetched um, etymological explanations for why Bakka is you know, a, a variant of Makkah, um, and that, you know, there's an etymology um, which has to do with thronging, uh, and it all seems terribly constrained. Um, but obviously, if, if this text went through the filter of an oral tradition, then really it shouldn't have been a problem to just replace place a B by an M. I mean, you wouldn't expect the name Bakka, which was clearly anomalous and obscure to the um, interpreters of the Quran to have remained in the text. It really should have been normalized to Makkah. Um, so, so that's um, an issue I have with this idea of protracted oral tradition. I just can't make um, um, head or tail of that. Um, in all fairness, so Stephen appreciates that certain interpretive puzzles that arise from the Quran um, shouldn't exist had there been an exclusive, exclusively all process of trans, uh, uh, transmission. So in the final chapter, he, he has recourse to an interesting auxiliary hypothesis, um, which is that certain parts of the Quran um, might actually predate Muhammad and had already been written down um, when they were encountered by Muhammad and his earliest uh, followers. For whatever reason, he writes, Muhammad and his coterie of followers must have revered the words of these ancient writings so much so that they eventually found their way into the canonical Quran. So we now get a sort of a combined scenario where there's a lot of oral tradition, but also some early material, potentially very early, potentially pre-Muhammadan, that, that, that somehow sort of got caught up in the process of Islamic kind of um, scripture formation. Um, um, but that to me then creates further muddles that um, aren't really solved in, in the book, certainly, um, because Stephen also argues at length that it's completely inconceivable that the rudimentary sort of literacy that existed in the Hijaz might have been harnessed to transcribe the Quran. So he rules out that there could have been writing in Muhammad's original milieu. But, but now we've got an auxiliary hypothesis that seems to be predicated on access to written material that was transmitted in writing because that's the only way of explaining um, the resistance that it offers to later interpretive construals. Um, um, I mean, I'm sure you know a further auxiliary hy hypothesis could be brought in, and, and maybe that's uh, normal in the kind of the you know emergence and development of um, of explanatory paradigms. But, but so far, I see a problem there. Um, third point: linguistic evidence. Um, um, that's a debate to which I'm really, um, for, you know, with regard to which I'm, I'm really a non-specialist uh, onlooker. There's a new book now by um, Marine van Putten, um, uh, trying to argue in detail that um, Quranic Arabic is Hejazi Arabic. Um, um, now it must be conceded that um, our understanding of the idiosyncrasies of Hejazi Arabic is, is often dependent on information supplied by Muslim linguists, right, who might have looked to the Quran as supposedly being in Hejazi Arabic, and then there's a circular argument. Um, so you can't just say, oh, the Quran has the features X, Y, Z, um, and we are told by later Muslim scholars that these are features of Hejazi Arabic because maybe they just got it from the Quran. Um, so I think that's a in part a valid objection, and, um, and, and Stephen raises it against um, some of the publications of, of Ahmed al-Jalad. Um, one would still expect that um, some of the, you know, that statements about dialectal variation in early Islam would to some degree have been controlled by, by common knowledge rather than just being exclusively derived from the Quran, but maybe, maybe that's just, you know, an optimistic assumption that one, can, that one could um, disagree with. Um, but the danger of, sorry, of, of, of circular inferences certainly doesn't work for um, this you know, famous phenomenon of the absence of glottal stops. So the Quran is commonly read with Hamzas, we know. Um, people like Van Putten tell us that um, very likely the Hamzas were put in at a secondary point, and he bases that on an um, you know, in-depth uh, study of Quranic orthography. Um, and we're also told by the Islamic tradition that the, um, the loss of glottal stops was a phenomenon of Hijazi Arabic. But, but it's certainly not a phenomenon that Muslim scholars would have associated with the text of the Quran, because the Quran was conventionally read with Hamzas. So at least that's one feature where I think the argument does, um, does hold. Um, and then there's the fact that there are some you know, rather fundamental religious terms in Quranic Arabic that have their immediate ancestors in classical Ethiopic, you know, of all languages. So, al-Injil, al-Hawariyun, um, Fatr, um, al-Shaitan probably, Jahannam. Um, 
Um, I mean, that certainly coheres very well with the supposition that um, at least some of the Christian traditions found in the Quran pass through Western Arabia, because why would you call the disciples of Jesus with an Ethiopic word if, if you are situated somewhere in Mesopotamia or Palestine? Um, um, right, so um, let me try to restate my overall case um, as boldly as possible in five remarks, and then I'll, um, I'll draw to a close. Um, first, um, again, I think there are undoubtedly some loose ends in the traditional paradigm of the Quran's genesis, um, the lack of attestation of you know, a, a communal Christian par um, presence in the Hijaz is an anomaly. Um, I've tried to gesture towards ways in which it might be mitigated, but there's a problem there, but you know, hey, such is life, one could say, you know, maybe <laughs> sometimes life is just not ideal. Um, secondly, I'm not actually dogmatically opposed to the hypothesis that there might be material in the Quran that postdates Muhammad. So I'm, I'm not in the business of kind of refuting that. Um, um, as I've argued before and um, would continue to do, um, this infamous, famous, notorious you know, verse in Surah 3, uh, 7, um, uh, the Muhkamat with the Shabihat verse. Um, I mean, I can't really prove it, but I mean, that to me is a, is a verse that actually makes a lot of sense as a comment by a community on a closed scriptural corpus that is more ambiguous than maybe people um, find it easy to accept. Um, so I could see this verse as a early post-prophetic comment that somehow made it into the Quran. I mean, again, I don't think there's compelling proof for that. I mean, it's not impossible that, you know, it's a late Quranic or, you know, late prophetic um, proclamation. But to me, that's actually a very, a very um, convincing candidate for um, a post-prophetic um, sort of comment by the early community that somehow ended up in the Quran. Um, um, poss possibly the, you know, the, the Basmala prefaces, maybe that's another case. Um, I think it would need to be looked at at a case-by-case -case basis. Um, um, thirdly, um, uh, I've contended that a late dating of the closure of the Quran to the second half of the seventh century also produces some very tangible loose ends. And um, I do find it um, unfortunate and I get impatient when scholars who you know, really like the um, alternative scenario don't seem very keen on sort of confronting those loose ends and um, maybe just acknowledging that they exist. Um, fourthly, um, apart from wanting such loose ends of the new revisionist scenario to be honestly addressed, recognized. Um, I would also quite like, um, and that's something that I tried to say in my abstract, I would also quite like a detailed analysis of the Quranic corpus that tries to really assign specific passages to specific stages of textual development. Um, so to say it really makes a welcome start on that um, um, because he gives us a list of surahs and you know, that's the first step, uh, so, so I think that's you know honest philological work. Um, that's fine. Um, um, what I, I guess what I find somewhat frustrating about um, Stephen's recent book is that um, we get a general narrative, a general model, but uh, but the number of specific Quranic passages that I actually discussed in detail is you know to my to my taste uh, fairly small. So I would have liked more of an attempt to say, oh, you know, this bit of Surah X. Um, is a good candidate for a tradition that preserves some authentic material, but this other bit um, is clearly, you know, an Iraqi conquest age, um, I don't know, sort of Umayyad loyalist edition. And, and maybe that can be done, but, but I think as long as it hasn't been done, the explanatory power of the alternative paradigm that's being proposed isn't really, I mean, it's, re it's really impossible to tell. I mean, we need that, um, um, you know, people, uh, I guess, getting their hands dirty. Um, and the fifth remark, and I'm really going to shut up, and that's really just to um, clarify what I meant by those last lines um, in my abstract, which were conceivably um, you know, written in a haste. Um, so I, I find it lamentable that instead of attempts to address these loose threats and you know, flesh out general postulates, what one sometimes gets um, in the writings of the new revisionists, if we want to you know, call them that, um, is a certain change in the topic of conversation. Um, so there seems to be a certain temptation um, to obscure the lack of engagement with inconvenient data, 
by switching into this sort of ethical register of discourse, um, which is predicated on the assumption or which kind of belabors um, this heroic principle that you know, truly critical, sober, neutral, dogmatically uncommitted scholarship on the Quran um, must end up debunking standard Muslim belief. Um, or more generally, you know, the assumption seems to be that genuinely critical scholarship will always end up you know, proving the opposite of what the believers um, believed all along. Um, um, I mean, that may be true. I mean, yeah, I think certainly, you know, doubt is, is, is a laudable stance to take. And I think, um, I, you know, I don't believe that um, we can say a lot about the historical Abraham. And um, I think the same willingness to um, doubt should certainly be extended to, to the Quran too, but um, I am somewhat, I guess, suspicious, mistrustful of the kind of heroic rhetoric here, which I think can function as a sort of displacement of, um, of the actual scholarly debate. So, inspect the, in, 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 this is just to, to quote Stephen again, instead of paying obeisance to the Islamic tradition, one must apply the methods and perspectives of religious and biblical studies, as, as if those were all sort of aligned in, in one direction only. Um, um, I mean, in all honesty, so, Stephen does grant that the motives for allowing the Islamic tradition to dictate terms, as he calls it, m might be superficially benign, you know, avoiding intellectual colonialism. Um, but um, I, I do think he implies fairly clearly that there's sort of a lamentable failure of nerves here, that um, it, this isn't really historical, this isn't really scholarly. And, and then in the last chapter of the book, um, this really becomes much more openly condescending. So scholars who fail to agree with him must be enthralled to what he calls a protectionist discourse that aims to shield the Quran from the rigors of historical critical analysis. And I guess that upset me because um, I suppose I fall under that, but I mean, it's really not what I do. I don't wake up in the morning trying to sort of protect Muslims from inconvenient truths. I'm just not yet fully convinced. And I dislike the implication that if you're not fully convinced by the arguments of another scholar, you're somehow not on a bona fide quest for truth. Um, now, I think equivalent aspersions are often cast the other way, right? There's sort of serial defamation of the great Patricia Croner, you know, who questioned lots of um, aspects of the standard narrative of Islamic origins um, and, and who's often misunderstood as having been sort of anti-Islamic for it. And I think that's um, regrettable. I mean, that shouldn't happen, shouldn't have happened. Um, um, I, I think it's pointless to kind of return the compliment now. I think we really need to sort of um, respect the good faith of those arriving at, arriving at different conclusions. And otherwise, the hysterical mood of social media will have finally won the day, and we don't want that. Um, so that's it.